Hi, Shannon Waller here, and welcome to a very special episode of the Team Success Podcast. And this is an author interview with someone who I am incredibly excited to share with you. This is David Emerald, the author of The Power of TED. TED is not TED Talks, as some of you may have been thinking. It's actually something called The Empowerment Dynamic. This was introduced to me by our brilliant, fabulous coach, Adrian Duffy. And as soon as I read it, I thought, where has this been all my life? It was really one of those moments. And then I realized, oh, this is actually a book we've carried on our bookshelves before. So I missed the memo (laughs) on that one. But before I jump in and start my conversation with you, David, let me just share some of David's bio and some of the accolades from the testimonials from the book. So who is David Emerald? And David Emerald, by the way, is the pen name of David Emerald Wommeldorf. I love that full name there. So David Emerald's insights come from over 30 years of study and lessons learned about effective relationships with a wide range of individuals and organizations. He and I are kindred spirits when it comes to organization development, by the way. His clients include Fortune 50 companies, government agencies, and nonprofits. As an executive coach and leadership and organization development professional, he's associated with the Leadership Circle and the University of Notre Dame's Steyer Center for Executive Education. So he knows of which he speaks. Also, some applause for TED, the Empowerment Triangle. Stephen Cartman, who we're going to talk about, who's the original creator or the originator of the Cartman Drama Triangle. Stephen Covey has written a great testimonial, as his Richard Rohr, and also Janet Harvey. So some very esteemed people have really raved about this, and I strongly encourage you, if you haven't already, to download it immediately. I bought it off Amazon.ca, and actually they had to order more because I bought them out. It is one of these books that once you hear our conversation and learn what it's about, you're going to want to get deeper into it for yourself and then also for your friends. I have gave it immediately to two friends, and they one of them actually texted me back twice saying, this is just what I needed to hear the way I needed to hear it. Thank you. Another one was, she's actually my physical trainer, my personal trainer, and and I drew it up on her whiteboard and it didn't leave for weeks and weeks. So (laughs) David, enough, (laughs) a long introduction for you. But first of all, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your incredible wisdom. And I really think it it is life-changing if people implement it in terms of what the power of TED. But before we jump into what that is, is there anything I've missed that's important for people to know about you before we get started? (laughs) Well, first of all, Shannon, I'm honored to be with you, and I'm flattered by that introduction. I think the only thing I would add, just for context, because I know that a lot of your audience are business people, is that I have spent about 40% of my career inside organizations, and then about 60% uh, as an external consultant, coach, et cetera. And um, so I have the internal experience as well as working with people from the outside, and I can't believe it's been over 30 years of experience, but here we are. (laughs) So I'm delighted to be with you. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to learning and hearing some stories of how it works, because this is something that's about our mindsets, about how we talk and how we think and how we behave. Yes. But we do that in more than just our home life, we do it at work. So how it applies to work will definitely be a focus of what we're going to talk about. So let's jump in so people can understand what the power of TED actually is. Now, the power of TED is actually starts with something called the drama triangle, or what you call the dreaded drama triangle, which has the lovely and accurate initials DDT. <laughs> it's just as bad as the chemical. That's right. So how, in your words, how would you describe the dreaded drama triangle? If you'll permit me, before I answer that question, let me just, for those who are not familiar with the book, just know that it is a fable, that it's written as a fable, and that it is actually a fable on what I call self-leadership rather than in and of itself being organizational leadership. But that's important to me in that I really have had as a kind of a fundamental assumption and belief is that the way we lead our own lives has everything to do with the quality of leadership we bring to our organizations, to our families, to our communities, et cetera. So the dreaded drama triangle, and you're right, I purposely chose the initials DDT because of the toxic nature of the relationship roles and dynamics. It was first articulated by Dr. Stephen Cartman back in the 1960s, and it is comprised of the roles of victim, which is the central role, and we're in the victim role anytime, anytime that we feel victimized. I'll often make a distinction between victimization and victimhood, which is an important distinction in that victimization is a situation. I'll talk about it being on the scale of one to 10. And for a lot of us, thank goodness, when we are victimized, it may be on the one, two, three end of the scale. And all we have to do is watch the news to see 
examples of the far end of that victimization scale. That's distinct, though, from victimhood, which is a way of being, a self-identity, et cetera. And so the book is really a challenger to victimhood, if you will. We'll talk about challenger later, while acknowledging the reality of victimization. But frankly, anytime we're complaining, anytime we feel helpless or powerless, we're in the victim role. And then in order to be a victim, on to the second role, one must have a persecutor. And the persecutor, Dr. Cartman really talked in terms of just human dynamics, but I've come to see that the persecutor can be a condition, can be health condition, or it could be situational, like a natural disaster. So whether that persecutor is a person, condition, or circumstance, it dominates the time and attention of the victim. And when the persecutor is a person, if the self-talk of the victim is poor me, the persecutor as a person kind of really piles on and says, yes, you poor so-and-so. In the DDT, for those whose go-to role is persecutor, underlying that role is really a fear of being a victim themselves. So they adopt a strategy that's better to dominate than to be dominated. So once the dynamic between the, the victim and persecutor comes into play, the third role that completes the DDT is the role of rescuer. Again, a rescuer does not have to be a person, very often is, but a rescuer could be any behavior, it could be an addiction, it could be anything that helps the victim numb out from their sense of powerlessness. And I can tell you as a recovering rescuer myself that that rescuers are well-intended when they come into the drama, but what they don't really realize and what was a real eye-opener for me is to realize that when I'm rescuing someone, if I'm seeking to either fix them or take care of them or to go, in a sense, go after the persecutor on their behalf, that what I'm really doing is reinforcing the powerlessness of the victim. I'm really reinforcing the victimization. And the reality is that the rescuer can come into the drama in one of three ways. The rescuer can impose themselves. They can be invited in. Very often the victim goes looking for a rescuer. And there's also what I've come to call the hoped for rescuer, where the victim is hoping for a rescuer, a rescuer to emerge, and they are behaving out of that hope. The example I use is driving down the freeway and some jerk passes you, and how many times we hope that there's going to be a police person around that next corner to pull them over. We want instant karma. <laughs> That's right. So again, the DDT is made up of the roles of victim, persecutor, rescuer. We all play all three roles. And it can be very dynamic. I've had people say, oh, gosh, I was in the meeting yesterday, and I played all three roles in the course of that meeting. Right. We have one of our concepts at Coach is complain or create, Uh which Mm -hmm. I thought you (laughs) like appreciate that. And really recognize that you can either complain about something, which means nothing's going to happen and you're a victim, or you can create a solution. But that's a different way of thinking about it, which we'll get into Mm -hmm. with you as well. But this is really prevalent. And I get to see it a lot, and I'm sure you have too, between team members. Obviously, we primarily work with entrepreneurs. Well, we work with entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And if a team member doesn't like how something's been done or this rules come down from on high, then there's lots of chatter and complaining. Right. But I've also heard the opposite where entrepreneurs kind of feel victim to the fact that their team isn't doing something or is doing something a way that they don't want. So this is sort of endemic in terms of everyone's conversation. Absolutely. It sounds like it's got these terms that may sound a bit dramatic. And there's a reason it's called the drama triangle, everybody. (laughs) It does lead to a lot of drama. Mm -hmm. It's often a lot more subtle than we appreciate, but it is constant. And it's around us a lot unless we make a shift, which fortunately you brilliantly provided. And by the way, your story... It's so fabulous. It's so engaging. You, it's it's like reading a novel. You can't mm. put it down. And then you realize, oh, this <laughs> this has a deeper meaning. And on the point of actually the dreaded drama triangle, you also say in the book that it is kind of the basis for most of our stories, most of our fairy tales. Oh, yes. If you look at movies, once you really understand it, you can't look at advertising the same. Movies are fairy tales. So much of our culture, look at our politics, whether it's Canadian or or U.S. politics, and I don't want to go there, but it's all based on that triangle. I do want to make a point just based on what you're saying about seeing it in business and is how many times a leader, a manager, well-intended, ends up stepping into what I call the hero rescuer role. It's like, oh, I'll take care of that for you, or you didn't do it quite right, and what happens And we could spend the whole hour talking about the DDT, and I know we don't want to do that. But it's important to know that all too often, 
the well-intended rescuer, and I think this is particularly true for the leader slash hero rescuer, is that eventually that hero rescuer gets seen as the next persecutor. And that's because from that rescuing role, again, you're inherently reinforcing the victimization of the victim. And eventually that victim is going to feel victimized by the rescuer imposing themselves. Well, and I think resentment is one of the emotions that I would feel. Sure. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, beat it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Get out of my way. <laughs> right. The victim then can become the persecutor to the former rescuer. So again, this is, to me, when I first learned about it, it was what I call a blinding flash of the obvious, a BFO, <laughs> in, that, in that it describes so much of both my personal and professional experience. But again, I got to emphasize that we all play all three roles and that it is, to me, what is brilliant about Dr. Cartman's uh, descriptions is that it's what I call a freeze frame. It's like kind of freeze the frame for a moment, who's in what role. But the reality is that it is a static depiction of a dynamic reality. Mm. Oh, that's a good description. It's a static depiction of a dynamic reality. So it's not that one always plays one of the roles. You're right. It can be very subtle. It certainly can be dramatic. But it can be as, you know, oh, here I am in the wrong line at the grocery store again, right? Poor me. (laughs) It can be any time that poor me is going on. So that's the DDT, yeah. Yeah, you've just described me driving most of the time. (laughs) Um, That would be true. It's interesting to me because... It doesn't only apply at work. I, mean, I think of families. Oh, my goodness. Watch, watch the roles rotate with, mm-hmm. you know, I've got two teenage girls, so you can imagine how that plays out. My husband tries to step in to be the rescuer, and then, then the kids relate right. to him as the persecutor, and then I'm trying to rescue, and it's just a disaster. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. When we do our two-day, what we call deeper dive, the second morning, we do a check-in, and it's always interesting for the people who are – local, when they go home, they almost always come back with some family story the night before and seeing their family dynamic differently. So you made this point earlier. I can tell you, and I feel so blessed and humbled by this, but the reality is we do a lot of this work in organizations and we get feedback all the time about the positive difference it makes at home. Yeah. Which I love. I actually consider professional development to be based on personal development Mm -hmm. and that if you can't grow professionally unless you're growing personally. So this covers the gamut as far as I'm concerned. You got it. Excellent. Now, before we leave the dreaded drama triangle, one other point that you bring up is that it's been part of our survival as a species up until now to respond in one of three ways to a potential attack. Right. we both could say it, but could you just describe that? Because I think I do want people to appreciate it's not unlike our gap concept, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, when you measure yourself against an ideal as opposed to measuring your progress, Mm -hmm. it's impossible to not occasionally go into the gap. The point is, how do you recognize it? And I think the dreaded drama triangle is put this way. It's been true up until all of our human history until now. It's unlikely going to change it overnight, but it's based on a survival mechanism, which I'd love for you to share. Yeah, it is. And it's really rooted in You all use the term mindset. We refer to orientations. In fact, Mm -hmm. we call it the FISB. I'll describe the FISB really quickly and then describe where the dreaded drama triangle resides. So FISB stands for, is the way that we frame the mindset or orientation. And we actually call it an internal human operating system. And the operating system is made up of three components. So FISB is the acronym for it. So first is where do you put your focus? What do you orient on? And whatever you orient on then engages an inner state, an emotional response. So IS stands for inner state. And that inner state then drives behavior. Mm -hmm. And the behavior that we engage in tends to reinforce the validity of what we focus on. So it ends up really being self-reinforcing. So one of the FISBs is what we call the problem or victim orientation. So let me describe briefly the FISB of the problem slash victim orientation, which is we focus on problems. When a problem occurs, it engages some level of anxiety or fear, which then drives reactive behavior. Mm -hmm. And now to answer your question, the reactive behavior tends to be some form of fight, flight, or freeze. And we've actually added a fourth, which is to appease, that sometimes the reaction may be to go along, to get along, 
but it's fight, flight, freeze, or appease. We either aggress against the situation or we try to get away from it or we do nothing and hope it will go away or appease, we go along to get along. So the dreaded drama triangle is the set of relationship roles and dynamics that thrive in that victim problem reactive orientation. Mm -hmm. And by the way, the orientation frameworks comes from, you mentioned in my bio, the leadership circle. I really learned about the framework. I came up with FISB, but with the mindsets from my dear friend, Bob Anderson, who first described it to me as an operating system. But if you think about the three roles of victim, persecutor, rescuer, they're all reactive in nature. They're all problem focused. They see one another as problems. So they just thrive in that problem reactive mindset. Which is such a great description. And I think certainly if I'm thinking about work things, it can be very easy to look around any company and go, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem. This person's a problem. This is a problem. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. There's never a lack. And one of the things that just struck me in the book, and I I went back several times to go, okay, I don't want to make sure I didn't miss it, is that there's a shift in orientation that can have you pay attention to only certain problems Mm -hmm. and kind of disregard the rest, which I found very liberating. And it kind of explained a lot of, you know, I've worked with Babs and Dan, co-founders of Strategic Coach since 1991, Mm -hmm. and it went, oh, that's how they do it. Because they're not focused on all Mm -hmm. the problems, just certain ones, which we're going to get to. So one of the things, it was really important to set the context of the dreaded drama triangle, but we're not going to leave you there. not at all. As a listener. (laughs) Thank goodness. Now, you have your own personal epiphany, which may have been a blinding flash of the obvious, but to my mind, it's actually quite profound, that there's a real shift in, as we've been talking about orientation or mindset, that has you approach the same circumstances from a completely different point of view. Yes. This is what I'm so excited about and working hard to get better at doing because it's not easy, as I've discovered. As am I. I. (laughs) It's a a practice. It's not a perfection. Mm -hmm. So can you please explain the empowerment dynamic and a little bit about what, it was obviously very personal for you, but also the difference you've seen it make with other people. Sure. I'll share a little bit of what I call the story behind the story, which is in the book. So I won't go through the whole thing. But as I learned about the Cartman drama triangle and working, frankly, with a therapist. As I was learning about it, one morning doing what I call my quiet time, just a period of contemplation, kind of prayerful contemplation, a lot of times journaling, I was really in a contemplative space and it was like, okay, I'm ready to surrender my victim stance in the world, but I need to know what's the opposite of victim. And like a flash, the word creator came into my mind. Can't say that I heard a voice, but I can see why some people would describe an experience like that, like hearing a voice, because it came immediately and my eyes flew open. So the shift that's at the core of all of this is shifting from victim to creator. And as we shift from victim to creator, and I'll talk in a few minutes about the shift of orientation that supports this or the shift to Fisbee, we'll come back to that. But I described Ted, the empowerment dynamic, as the antidote to the toxicity of the DDT. Mm -hmm. And the fundamental shift is a shift from victim to creator. And as a creator, to me, there are two primary components. One is our capacity to envision outcomes and create outcomes, which we'll talk more about. The second, which is really important to the way that you just set this up, is that as a creator, I have the capacity, I also have the responsibility to choose my response Mm. to my experience, to choose my response to what shows up. And one of my favorite examples that is in the book is Viktor Frankl, who was, as a young psychiatrist, was interred in three different Nazi concentration camps in World War II. So if you think about victimization on the scale of one to 10, his experience was like a 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that experience, his epiphany, which led to his life work, was that there was one final freedom his captors could not take from him, and that was his freedom to choose his response to the situation he found himself in. That's not quite quote-unquote, but that's the essence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to me, that is a supreme example of our capacity as a creator to choose our response. So creator stands as the antidote to the role of victim. And over many, many years, I started to play around with, well, if creator is the opposite of victim, 
is there an opposite to the persecutor and to the rescuer roles? And there is. The antidote to the role or the opposite of persecutor is that of challenger. And I need to speak to that from two different kind of directions. One is when stuff happens in life and stuff does happen, whether it's a person, condition, or circumstance that comes into our lives that as a victim we would react to, as a creator, we can choose our response. And the way that we choose our response really starts with the question of what has this person, condition, or situation come into my life to cause me to learn or to spark learning, growth, and development. Mm -hmm. And then also the reality that we as leaders, and for those who are leaders in organizations, to be what I call a conscious constructive challenger, to challenge others from what I call learning intent, that it's not a looking good intent, it's not to be right, it's not to be the rescuer, but to challenge others to grow and to develop and to do that from a learning intent and to see them as creators in their own right, whether they act like it or not, and whether they know it or not. <laughs> so again, the antidote of the role of persecutor is the role of challenger. And then the antidote to the role of rescuer, which is, again, intended to be a helping role, there is a helping role in the empowerment dynamic, and that's the role of coach. So coach is the antidote to the role of rescuer. And as you well know, as a coach, we hold our clients as ultimately, I want to underscore ultimately, creative, resourceful, and whole, mm -hmm. that they have the answers or they can discover the answers or they can come up with their solutions. So as coaches, our basic toolkit is asking questions, is inquiry, mm -hmm. and that we ask questions to help clarify outcomes or we ask questions to help assess and clarify current reality, you know, what's going on in current reality that's helpful, what's going on in current reality that's, that are problems that we need to address and service the outcomes. We'll talk more about that. And certainly asking questions around committed next steps mm -hmm. and really closing that gap between the, the ideal and the goal. So the three roles that make up the antidote to the DDT, which is the empowerment dynamic, are creator, challenger, and coach. Fantastic. You're so articulate about this. I'm writing down <laughs> extra <laughs> notes about it. You do know that coach is pretty much my favorite word in this whole, <laughs> this whole uh, Why am I surprised? <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> or not surprised, I should say. I kind of jokingly say that, but a creator is, I think, the real heart of the matter. Because when everyone can take ownership of the experience or your response, is, but it, your response to the experience, that's where all of the power and the strength and the resilience and the resourcefulness comes from. So I really do think it starts there. You're absolutely right. In fact, all three, you know, one of the things I often say about the DDT, not to go back to that, but just to make a point is that at its core, all three of the DDT roles are victim roles, mm -hmm. or they're trying to control the environment so that they don't become victims. And the empowerment dynamic at the core, all three roles are creator roles, and they are the essence of collaboration and co-creation. Whereas I'm not surprised that coach is your favorite word. I can tell you that, <laughs> in fact, I'm in the process of developing a workshop just on becoming a conscious constructive challenger. Ooh. Because that's one of the, I realize it's a double use of the word, but it, it really is the most challenging role for people to really step into because of the fear that if I'm a challenger, I'm going to be perceived as a persecutor and blah, 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 blah. Whereas there's a lot of really good and certainly strategic coach teaches coaches to be really effective coaches and inquirers. So I, I think that the growing edge for a lot of people is that challenger role, but all three roles are creator oriented. That's a great point. And it is hard to challenge well mm -hmm. without stepping over into the the nether regions, right. yes. the nethers, other yes. than the nether bad side. But I think that's key. Although I do know some people who naturally start there. So them actually learning how to do it consciously and constructively, yeah. I think would be a great training as well. I think that's a great point. But I think recognizing that the entire, the heart of this whole model is being creative. It's being constructive. It's being conscious right. and bringing that to 
a situation. I was listening to this great parenting coach, Dr. Shafali, and she says, we all have to learn how to deconstruct our patterns, mm -hmm. our unconscious patterns, so we can be conscious. She talks about conscious parenting, hysterically funny if you ever get a chance to watch her. But that's what I was thinking about is I'm, I'm like, this is deconstructing the dreaded drama triangle and what roles we're playing so that we can bring it to a higher level of thinking and mindset and approach the problems much differently. Another workshop, just saying, because I know a lot of people struggle with actually knowing what they want. Absolutely. They know what they don't want. Right. I had this conversation with a friend of mine and she says, I know what I don't want. I'm not so sure I'm clear of what I do mm -hmm. want. And this is a key part of, let's just talk about this for a moment, because sure. we can be reactive to what we don't want, but it's a whole step up. And you actually talk a lot about one of the characters in the book who had to spend quite a few days, quite a period of time figuring out what she wanted. So mm -hmm. let's talk about why that's a challenge sometimes. Sure. Well, part of it is that, as we talked about a few minutes ago, the reality is that that problem reactive orientation I believe the reality is that it's our default orientation as human beings, and it has helped us survive as a species. Mm -hmm. So kind of encoded in us, I think it's the language I use, I think that that mindset is deeply wired in us, but not hardwired, mm. meaning it's not that we can't change it, but it's deeply encoded in, in us, frankly, through evolution. So as our ancestors were walking through the forest or the brush or whatever, and they were scanning for threats, that is a way of scanning for what you don't want and what you don't like, which is, again, mm -hmm. why it's a problem orientation. Mm -hmm. So it takes conscious focus. It takes time because you're absolutely right. And this is true for in organizations and for teams and leaders at times as well, which is, you know, we know what we don't want, but what's the outcome that we really do want? What is it that we really are committed to? What is it we really do care about? Mm -hmm. That is easier asked than answered at times. <laughs> yes. So you're absolutely right. And really at the core of all of this work is also some ideas. We can't be prescriptive, but some ideas describing ways that we can shift from the core roles from victim to creator, which you've already hit on it. The basic question is the question of what do I want? Or if it's a team, what do we want? Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and walk through kind of the essential question of the other two shifts. So the, the shift from persecutor to challenger is what's my intention? Mm. Is my intention to look good or is my intention to, is it a learning intent? Before we leave that one, you made a really good point in the book and also what you're leading to now is that there's a lot about looking good. It's very ego driven. Yes which I found a fascinating and very astute point when I'm like, yes, it's so true. And there's a lot of ego in the entire drama triangle, but especially with the persecutor. <laughs> well, yes. So, mm -hmm. And I can feel it sometimes when you want to be the hero and you want to ride in on your white horse and scoop up whoever needs scooping up and right. get the applause and all the rest of it. It's, but there's a little switch I noticed in myself where I'm just like, oh, yes, yeah. this is going to look good. And so the looking good is right. such a great question to mm -hmm. ask. So let's talk about ego for a sec before sure. we leave this, because I think that's a key point, especially for those of us who have high aspirations. And how do we manage that? Great point, Shannon. And actually, I would say that ego in a more subtle way also shows up in the rescuer role in mm -hmm. that, you yes, know, you know, yes. I, I saved the day. Look at me. Uh, <laughs> look how helpful I am. Right. So it shows up in the rescue role as well as the persecutor role from the standpoint of persecutor feeling I've got to be right. I've got to show my power. I've got to show my moxie, whatever. The mindset of the problem reactive victim orientation is one of really of protection hmm. that I'm seeking to protect how I'm being seen from a developmental psychology standpoint. It's a Robert Keegan calls a socialized self mindset that who I am is how people see me right. and how they would describe me and especially that rescue role if they describe me as a great rescuer then my ego gets fed yes your heart beats a little faster <laughs> that's actually the white knight on the exactly horse, I was mistaken. well no that, that's yeah. okay and then as a persecutor if i get to be right if i get to be in control then i'm seen as powerful then i'm seen as controlling so both of those roles are steeped in ego and in a really subtle way the victim also is uh, ego protection in that if I can prove to you that I'm being victimized, then it's not my fault. Then I'm off the hook. I don't have to take responsibility. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. 
All right, so let's go back to Challenger and how we okay. can get out of that looking good and into what's my intention? Because that's so much of a better question. Yeah, and so the question is, am I coming from a learning intent? Mm. And the basic shift is from putting down or being one up to learning and growth in the other and in self because in a co-creative relationship, as I consciously and constructively challenge you, I'm learning along with you. Right. And then the core shift from rescuer to coach is pausing and asking oneself the internal question, how am I seeing the other? Am I seeing them as a problem? Mm -hmm. Am I seeing them as less than? Am I seeing them as needing to be fixed? Or do I see them as a creator, whether they know it or not, whether they act like it or not? So the basic move there is to move from telling, which is what, in a way, rescuers are typically doing, even though they may think they're doing it through questions, whatever. They're, they either tell or do for the other, and the shift to asking. Mm-hmm. And I have a, a mantra that I use a lot, in the, uh, especially in some of the coaching at Notre Dame, which is that I assign to a lot of leaders, and that mantra is to ask first, tell second. Mm-hmm. ask first, tell second, because the hero rescuer wants to tell, just go off and do A, B, C, and D. Whereas here's what, I'll take a moment, but here's what becomes available if one can shift to this ask first, tell second. So let's say I'm a direct reporter of yours and I come into you and I say, Shannon, I got this issue. What do you think I should do? In your mind, it's like, well, David, you should do A, B, C, and D, but you start practicing ask first, tell second. And you say something like, David, I, I've got some thoughts, but what have you thought of so far? I'm likely to say something like, you know, I think I should do A, B, D, and E. Now, you've got a great opportunity to reinforce my thinking, say, David, I think A, B, and D are spot on. Hadn't thought about E. I think that's a great idea. The only thing I'd add is I suggest that you do C as well. Now, I'm going to go off much more highly motivated because I'm implementing my ideas that you reinforced and added to, and an innovative idea made it on the table it probably wouldn't not have happened had you said, oh, David, if I were you, I'd do A, B, C, and D. Mm. So this notion of ask first, tell second has great mentoring components to it, has great empowerment components to it. Oh, this is so useful because we've been getting some coaching from a couple of places about the importance of asking. And a great coach asks great questions. We feel the same way about that. It's interesting because when I'm coaching my clients, I automatically do that. I would never dream of telling them. And yet internally with colleagues and team members, it's very easy if I'm feeling rushed or if I think Mm -hmm. they're feeling rushed Mm -hmm. and they just want a simple answer, darn it, then I'm going to say, well, I would do this, this, and this. Or sometimes I'll say, have you tried this? It's that consciously asking and biting my tongue and going, hmm, Mm -hmm. I have some thoughts and what do you think we should do? Now, I do try and do that with my kids because I want them to think for themselves. It's very easy Mm -hmm. to forget in those fast rushed moments or when someone's looking distressed to just want to put the Band-Aid on and solve the problem. Right. Oh, I love it. Well, and I'm going to pick up on just a word that you used in that great point that you just made, which is that it takes conscious awareness, conscious focus. Mm -hmm. And if I can, that to me takes us to the second of the mindsets or orientations, which is what I call an outcome orientation at, is really the basic way of saying it, which is really the orientation of a creator. And it's an upgrade of the eternal operating system. I love that. An upgrade. Oh. It's an upgrade in the personal operating system. And so the FISB of the outcome orientation or creator orientation is that we focus on outcomes, on envisioned outcomes, and that if we care about those outcomes, which is an important qualifier, is that if we care about those outcomes, it engages an inner state of passion or desire. Mm -hmm. And there's a range of passion. It can be, I think when we think of passion, we think of the fire in the belly, and that's a wonderful form of passion. But it's really about caring. You know, I do care about our clients. I do care about my teammates. I do care about the quality of our products and services, et cetera. So the focus on outcomes engages an inner state of passion or desire, which gives us the energy to take whatever the next step is, or what I call baby steps, to take baby steps in service to the outcome. Mm. And every time we take a baby step, we get closer to or clearer about that envisioned outcome. Now, here's the connection to conscious awareness, is that whereas the problem reactive victim orientation 
is often running in the background, just like the computer operating system is running in the background of our two computers here. In order to upgrade and shift to that creator orientation does require conscious awareness and focus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if operating from a creator orientation all the time is possible. And I'm committed to living my life dedicated to its possibility. <laughs> yes, it's challenging. I looked over my behavior in the last 24 hours and I was like, oh no. It's <laughs> <laughs> so a couple times where I made some very obvious missteps. Just knowing it is not enough. Practicing it is really, really essential. I love this outcome orientation. And this is really what struck me when I was reading the book. I'm like, oh, Babs and Dan consistently just, well, they're totally focused on outcomes and then only solving the problems that are in the way of those outcomes. Exactly. The rest of them, to use my very good friend Kathy Davis's expression, she's like, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. so, so they don't get distracted by some of the other dramas, I'm going to call them that, right. that other people have is taken their attention because they're so just 100% focused on their outcomes. One example, again, it was so fun because... Your book explains people I know really well, even better to me (laughs) than I knew them before, which is kind of miraculous. And Dan had, he calls them two report cards one day. And this was, goodness, 19, what, I can't remember what year it was, a long time ago. You get divorced and bankrupt on the same day. He didn't orchestrate it or plan it that day. The divorce happened in the morning. He took himself out for a nice lunch and then had to hand in the credit card for for the bankruptcy as he jokes about it. And he paid everyone back if anyone wants to know. But the thing that he realized is that he didn't know what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And as he said, people are very generous after that. They give you a lot of time to think on your own (laughs) (laughs) after those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So he started writing down every single night. And Dan doesn't do things in small ways. So his time frame was 25 years. He did it for Uh all but 12 of those, Mm -hmm. 12 days of those 25 years, where he would write down every night before he went to bed something he wanted in his life the next day. Could be small, could be big, didn't really matter. And at the end of 25 years, he stopped the practice because at that point, he really knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And he knew the type of business he wanted in terms of one where there would be no accounts receivable ever, which is why as clients of Strategic Coach know, you pay up front. He knew exactly what he wanted in a business partner. He knew exactly what he wanted in a life partner. And all of that has come true. In fact, much, much, much bigger results have happened than he even could have dreamt of back then. But he just got really, really clear on what he wanted versus what other people had wanted for him, Sure. what he thought was fulfilling other people's expectations. And he made a decision again, which I was like, oh, this is Dan on, on paper. He said he absolved every single other person for any responsibility for his circumstances. Uh, he took full mm-hmm. ownership and responsibility and absolved anyone else of any kind of blame. And his life from then on was his own. And he decided that he would be the creator of that. So different set of circumstances, but came to a very similar vein of thinking. Absolutely. And I was kind of reading the book and thinking about Dan going, hmm, this is the same thing, which is really kind of a joyous thought. So this creator orientation is so critical to success, I think, for people in their own lives, but particularly in business. And I know engagement is a huge passion of yours. So talk about a little bit why this orientation works so much better, in, especially in companies and for people. Well, I will do that. But before, just mm-hmm. on your story, sharing Dan's story, what is inherent in the absolving of other people in order to more most powerfully move into that creator orientation and into the empowerment dynamic, there are times whether it's big or small, that forgiveness is absolutely critical. Mm. I wish I could say that I came up with this, although it is in the book, but I was actually in a workshop that I was managing at a university at one point when I was internal in an organization. And somebody quipped and just said, well, you know what forgiveness is, don't you? It's giving up all hope of a better past. (laughs) Yes, I have heard. I've heard Dan say that too. And that has so stayed with me. And so in the workplace, whether it's something that happened yesterday that I didn't like the way that somebody said something to me, being able to give up the hope that somehow that's going to, you know, it's in the past. So Mm -hmm. just the role of forgiveness is huge and really sustainably making the kind of shift that we're talking about. What we have found, I'll give you one example that we're allowed to talk about is we've done quite a bit of work for the last few years with Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the top five healthcare systems, our understanding is in the world, it's certainly in the United States, 
in terms of reputation. Mm -hmm. And they came to us at one point, they were already using the empowerment dynamic in their leadership academy, but they came to us around some issues around employee engagement and said, is there a way that we could, without going through the whole structure, but is there a way that we could frame and that you could help us in the development of a curriculum to help those because what they decided to do, which I thought was brilliant, was to train the leaders slash managers of those parts of the hospital system that had high engagement scores to equip them with some tools that could help them mentor those who were in the lower third in terms of employee engagement. And by the way, this is a mini case that is available on our website. We can talk about website later. So one of the things that we did was it was one of the early framings of the frameworks that are in TED, most of which we've already talked about, but framing them into what we call the three vital questions. They had us come in and we did a day for, it was the first part of the curriculum. There were other things that they did, but we really helped equip these leaders, managers with this idea of these three vital questions, which incorporate the frameworks we've been talking about. And they then had those questions top of mind. They had some learning aids that helped them. And what we know, I can't remember the stat right now, but the engagement scores went up dramatically. Because here's what we know is that if you and I are relating as co-creators and we are at least attempting to the best of our ability to be creators, challengers, and coaches, We feel more engaged. Again, that orientation is passion-based. It's focusing on what we do want and what we care about. And it very much has an impact on the engagement level of people because they're not in drama as much. One of the things, just a quick aside, is that did some research in preparation for an e-course that we have that around the cost of drama. And one of the stats that came up is that It's estimated that managers spend at least 40% of their time dealing with conflict, i.e. drama. Oh, my goodness. What an incredibly frustrating way to spend your time. And what if we could cut that in half? And what would be the Mm -hmm. redeployment of that time and energy into what we want, what we want to create, how we support our customers, our employees, et cetera, is a big part of why we're doing this work. So that's a long answer to your question about engagement, but an environment in which our attention is on what we want, our intention is to bring the outcomes that we envision into fruition. And the results are ones of over time via baby steps, bringing those outcomes to fruition, as you said earlier, also solving problems in service to those outcomes but we're solving problems that are in service to the outcomes Uh rather than just whatever the next incoming is, which is what happens in the the reactive orientation. (laughs) So that's a much more engaging kind of environment. Wow, that's fantastic. I had a specific thought come up in terms of what if you are committed to, as a manager, as a leader, as a business owner, as a team member, committed to playing the roles of creator, challenger, and coach rather than Mm -hmm. victim, persecutor, or rescuer, and yet you're working with someone who just seems entrenched in the drama triangle, and no matter what you do, treats you as, for example, the persecutor when absolutely that's not your intention. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some people have that question in mind. What what do you coach? What do you suggest? Well, first of all, that question comes up every workshop. Oh, good. Uh, so, (laughs) So it's a great question. And my answer may be less than satisfying for some people. That's okay. Which is that what we've come to really learn is that We can't make shift happen in others. (laughs) Yes. Right? So the best we can do or what's most important is modeling the behaviors. But I will give you a time-tested technique. I don't like the term technique, but it's a process that I have seen really work. The other thing I've learned is that you cannot argue against someone's sense of victimization. So if you're complaining about something, one of my favorite quotes from uh, Lisa Leahy and Bob Keegan at Harvard is that behind every complaint lies a commitment because we don't complain about things that we don't care about. So if I can be conscious and I can listen to someone, whether they're whining, complaining that they're in the victim role, here's the technique is that you acknowledge their emotion So I might say, Shannon, gee, I can understand that you're really frustrated. Mm -hmm. 
And given the situation, what do you choose as your next step? So it's not piling on it so that you feel heard and seen, but then to ask a coach question or maybe a challenger, but a lot of times coach question using that magic word and, you know, and what's the next baby step? So it's really helping them shift. Or I might say, I really get why you're frustrated. And so how people treat one another, I can see is really important to you. Mm -hmm. So again, that's speaking to the commitment behind the complaint, what the person cares about that has them complaining. Mm -hmm. And then asking a question in service to what it is that they really do care about, i.e. what it is that they really want. Love it. That's great coaching. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. I want to get more into the three vital questions. But before we do that, there's one other aspect, which I think it's good to be aware of before people try and put all this into practice. And that is dynamic tension. Right. And what comes up when you're faced with problems or outcomes. So how do you describe dynamic tension? And I think it's very much part of the conscious awareness that you were we were talking about earlier. Right. And it is consistent with there's some nuances that are a little bit different from Dan's the gap and the gain. But it's our derivation of work from Robert Fritz and his structural or creative tension. Mm-hmm. So briefly describing it, it really is, so I grew up in the Midwest of the U.S. I say that because it's like, okay, this stuff has to be practical. How do we put it into practice? How do we create outcomes? And that's the question that Robert Fritz was focused on is how do we create anything? And it's basically a three-step process that the first step is the envisioned outcome. What is it that we want? And a very powerful question that comes from Robert Fritz is, and if we had what we wanted, how would we know it? Ooh, good question. And here's one of the nuances as I looked at Dan's work is that sometimes it's clear and concrete and measurable, Mm -hmm. and other times it may be more vague and directional. Mm -hmm. It's like, I know that the outcome is in this direction, so I'm even though I don't know what the final form is going to look like, I'm going to head in that direction. Mm -hmm. And that first step of the envisioned outcome roots us then, anchors us in that outcome creator orientation. As much as I would love to believe that if we just set the intention, it's going to manifest, that's not my experience. (laughs) Me either. So the second step in dynamic tension is being able to tell the truth about what's going on in current reality in relation to that vision. And to do what I call a balanced scorecard, just kind of using that phrase, and being able to identify what's going well, what's supporting What am I doing or what do I see going on around me that supports that outcome and what's going on in current reality that's getting in the way of that outcome? And that's where problems reside in Mm -hmm. this outcome creator orientation. Mm -hmm. And then we engage that tension between what we want and what we have, the current reality, and that the way that we resolve that tension over time is through committed baby steps. Mm -hmm. Baby steps are short term. They're immediate. They're things that we can act on, that it's not dependent. I can invite you to act on it with me, but it's not dependent on you acting on it with me. So I may have the authority to call a meeting. I can't control the outcome of that meeting. Mm -hmm. So the three steps are envisioned outcome, assessing current reality, and then committing and taking baby steps. And here's one of the things that I need to say about baby steps. And I know that we're coming toward the end of our time is that Every time you take a baby step, one of three things is going to happen, guaranteed. So one thing is you take a baby step and it's forward progress. Mm -hmm. It's building momentum. Great. It's further support on the outcome, the envisioned outcome. Second thing that could happen is I take a baby step and it's a step back. It's a mistake. It didn't work the way I thought it would. And when that happens, we can see it as a challenger and say, how do we learn? What do we need to adjust? And then, Shannon, here's the third possibility, is that you never know when a baby step is going to be a breakthrough or a quantum leap that would not have happened had you not taken that baby step. I love it. So this notion of baby steps, although it may sound kind of cutesy to some people, it really is about short-term kind of small steps, things that I can do. So again, it could be call a meeting or go gather this information or schedule a podcast or it's whatever the next step is in that creating process. I'm kind of grinning on the outside and the inside because so much of what you're talking about is exactly what our strategic coach thinking tools do. So if I think about the experience transformer, which is when something did not go well, well, what Mm. about the situation worked? What didn't? 
knowing what we know now, what will we do differently next time and what are the strategies? Our whole strategy circle, what's the goal? What's the result? Our definition is what does it look like when it's done and done well? Not mm -hmm. very dissimilar from Robert Fritz's. Yep. And then what are all the obstacles in the way? And then what are the strategies to help do it? And it's got to turn into a verb. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I love it. And I'm a big fan of One Small Step Can Change Your Life by Dr. Robert Moore about those simple steps. But I love the point about it. You know, you don't know which next step will be the big breakthrough or the quantum leap. And that's such right. a brilliant thing to remember. So you and I could talk forever. <laughs> Yes, we could. <laughs> we have lots, yes, of, we lots could. in common. I love it. Yeah. All right. So I want to get into the three vital questions. And just for you listening, I was thrilled to learn that you, David, have an online course that people can do. And so we're going to stay tuned mm -hmm. for some website links and some awesome learning opportunities. Obviously, jump on to Amazon or your favorite online or offline retailer to grab a copy of the book. But there's so much more. And this has already been an incredibly rich conversation. But there's ways people can bring this into their companies now, which I find yes. incredibly mm -hmm. appealing. And if you want to have a more engaged we talk about people having self-managing companies, self-multiplying companies, and I talk about friction and drag. Mm -hmm. The drama triangle at work is friction and drag. It holds you back. Absolutely. And if people are spending 40% of their time, managers are spending that much time trying to manage conflict, good grief. <laughs> Let's do something about that. Right. And here's a technique and strategy and process that absolutely works. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm excited to share that with people when we get to the end, but we're not there yet. So you have figured out, as you said, working with the Cleveland Clinic, which has a stellar reputation, three vital questions to help people, I would say, flip out of that victim orientation mm -hmm. and into the outcome orientation or the problem into the outcome orientation that are really, really powerful questions. So take it away. Tell us sure. what those three vital questions are. Well, I appreciate that. It's the context that we use in organizations, especially, although it's, it's personally applicable as well, that is just a recontextualizing what you and I've already talked about in this mm -hmm. conversation. So the first vital question is where are you putting your focus? Are you focusing on problems? Or are you focusing on outcomes? Mm -hmm. Eventually that gets reframed into a victim orientation and a creator orientation. So the first vital question is where are you putting your focus? The second vital question is how are you relating? How are you relating to others? How are you relating to your experience? What's going on around you? How are you relating to yourself? And are you relating in ways that produce or perpetuate drama? Or are you relating in ways that empower others and yourself to be more resourceful, resilient, and innovative? So that is obviously the DDT, the empowerment dynamic, and how shifts happen between the roles of the two. And then the third vital question, which is the dynamic tension question, is what actions are you taking? Mm -hmm. Are you merely reacting to the problems of the moment? Or are you taking creative and generative action, including the solving of problems, in service to outcomes? Mm -hmm. Those are such simple questions, but they totally get, is what my mother, Marilyn Waller, would say, to the heart of the matter, <laughs> which is the deal. And there's one point, I've said this before in other podcasts, but I love the fact that the words reactive and creative have the same letters. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Rearranged. Right. And so when you rearrange your focus, when you rearrange how mm -hmm. you're relating, you can rearrange your response to be a much more creative as opposed to reactive one. And upgrade yeah. your operating system. Okay, everybody, yeah. let's just upgrade our operating system, <laughs> shall we? We now have the wisdom and the knowledge. Let's do it. Let's do it. Right. So you've seen people really – now, do people ask these in one-on-one -on -one conversations? Do they ask them in meetings? How do people use them in day-to-day -day practice and business? All the ways that you just yes. asked. But I know of <laughs> several companies and leaders who have taken the diagrams of the FISBs, mm -hmm. taken the triangles – and by the way, little thing, but what you'll see at the book and in our materials, the drama triangle is a downward pointing triangle because it's unstable and downward energy. Mm -hmm. Whereas Ted, the empowerment dynamic is upward pointing and it's on a solid base. So just a, a little symbolic point. But people have put them in conference rooms or have them in one leader of a, um, actually an entrepreneur of a company of about, I think about 45, 50 people has put it in his office and his conference room and has given people in his organization permission at any point in time to say, to call timeout and to ask the question, where are we? I like that. And it's not, oh, uh, Shannon, you're just being a victim. It's not that. It's like, pause, where are we? That wouldn't help much, just saying. 
<laughs> but to use those questions, how are yeah. we relating? Right. You know, what are the dynamics that are existing right now? Or what are we focusing on? Are we just focusing on a problem that's causing us to react? Or what does that problem stand in relation to that we want to create? So it can be used in one-on-one conversations. It can be used in team meetings. I dare say it can be used in just about any aspect of life. I'm picturing people making up hats. Sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> With little term. I'm feeling like a victim right now. Which, you know, I, I don't know if anyone would be bold enough to actually do that, but it could lend a little bit of levity to, to the conversation. And then someone else could just shove the creator hat over to that person. But yeah, I think just the awareness of what's going on and to ask the question, what are we right. doing right now? Where are we at? Mm-hmm. Is so powerful because that's that pause. Whereas otherwise we tend to get caught up in it. And uh, absolutely. I'm sure there's lots of chemicals that get released in our bodies when we're playing that drama role. It's why television is entertaining. And what we know is that reactivity begets reactivity begets reactivity. So, Right. Yeah. Yeah. And some people are kind of hooked on drama. Oh, yeah. There's a chemical rush. There is a chemical rush. Yep. There's an addiction going on. All right. Well, and actually, that's one of the points that you make in the book, too, which I found totally fascinating, is that Another form of being a rescuer can be something that numbs us. Exactly. So, you know, all the addictions fit into that, which was kind of a fascinating point. That's a whole other conversation. But that's a form of rescue, which is interesting. But when you don't need to do that and you've got a coach and you're recognizing that you're the creator and then you look at situations instead of Mm -hmm. being persecuted, that they're, in fact, opportunities to learn and grow and a positive challenge, totally different framework from which to operate. I love it. So... I think it's time to start giving them some information about how they can track you down. And I'm excited because I really do. Everyone knows I'm so passionate about team success and I'm always looking for, I call them maximizer strategies. This comes from my strength finder, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maximizer and strategic being my top two that also are simple according to my three and fact finder and, and Colby. So I like simple, really effective strategies that maximize what people are up to And as I think business is the most really powerful place for people to grow personally, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. And this is like, oh my gosh, someone just gave me this massive gift when they Mm -hmm. showed me your book and your diagram. So where can people get the models? Can they get that from your website? Can they get that from Googling it? And how can they get in touch with that course and see a sample of, of your work? Sure. So a couple of things. One is the basic website is Mm powerofted.com. I do want to remind your listeners that the basic work is really more around personal development, but there is a drop down menu for organizations. So if you go to the website and then look for the four organizations, you'll see a lot of what we talked about, including a short paper on the three vital questions is also on there. You referenced, or we talked about there being an e-course. We just launched it this year. It's an eight-module, self-paced. We have teams that go through it together. And if you want to kind of preview it, I would have people go to learn.powerofted.com and then forward slash demo dash page dash one backslash. And that draws from, I think, four different of the eight modules. You'll see how it's laid out in the course itself. There's a downloadable PDF workbook. There are about 22 or so short videos of uh, presenting material, and it's been getting really good reviews, I'm, I'm delighted to say. Congratulations. So those are the main things. Eventually, there will be a Three Vital Questions website. We haven't developed that yet. I am currently in the process of writing that book which hopefully will be out middle of next year. Also, there's a section in the website with videos, and there are videos in which I'm presenting the models. Some of them are a few years old, but are still the basic models. Mm -hmm. And there's also a Power of Ted YouTube page that has those videos. But you can either access those through YouTube or through the website. And I want to strongly recommend that everyone go and do that because I took the liberty of sharing this, as I mentioned. So, I mean, fortunately, Adrian was able to introduce me to you, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm like, good, because I'm telling everyone about him. Because I coach, so I coach our entire strategic coach team. I drew the models, 
before I figured out how to actually get a copy of them. So I drew the <laughs> models. I didn't coach it because I don't know what to coach it. But I showed everyone and we talked mm-hmm. about it. And that was pretty insightful. And I said, okay, where do you think you hang out? And, mm-hmm. you know, asked a few Google questions. And then also I shared this with all of the team leaders that I coach. Awesome. So I might, you want to go and get this book. In fact, I'm buying it for everyone in December for those workshops. So Wonderful. if you're listening, you're going to be have that part of the curriculum. Just because I want people to have this information and the uptake has been instantaneous. We can all see ourselves in the dreaded drama triangle. And we can also, because coach is very outcome oriented. I mean, I love the fact that we help our clients get clear on what they want. In Dan's 10 times program, we talk about having a 25 year framework and each quarter is 1%, 1%, you know, one of 100 quarters. So baby step. And then we talk about three-year goals in the signature program. So mm-hmm. we do a lot of this, unbeknownst to us <laughs> in this model, but a lot of the coaching and the work that we do with our clients is completely 100% aligned with everything that you're talking about here. Absolutely. So I just wanted everyone to know, just have more context for why I am so excited about this and the impact that it's had on people that I've just even briefly shared it with by demonstrating the model. So... David, I can't thank you enough. I feel like there's 18 more things we should talk about, but it is it is time to wrap up. Are there any final thoughts before I wrap up? And I'll restate some of those websites as well. But any anything else you want people to know or any other thoughts about this? And by the way, I'm hoping that you will commit to allowing me to interview you for your next book, The Three Vital Questions, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, first thing that comes to mind is I just want to acknowledge and really express my gratitude for Adrian Duffy's introduction to you and Adrian has become a friend as well as a colleague. And I think that the closing thing that I would say is that this is lifelong work and that I'm still working on it. You're still working on it. So self-compassion is a really critical component. And to me, the measure of progress of really living into adopting a creator orientation and the, the empowerment dynamic roles of creator, challenger, and coach is the measure of progress is do I catch myself sooner and do I make an empowered choice? Mm. Because we have run into situations where people can engage their internal persecutor in that, oh gosh, I know this stuff. Why do I still react? Because you're human. (laughs) So I can't overemphasize that this is a lifelong practice and to have that self-compassion. I love it. Well, in fact, yesterday when I knew I was like, oh, what have I got caught up in? And I was like, okay, I just have to forgive myself because that was all there was to do and do it better next time and send my apology text. And that was my best way of handling it. But it really is awareness. I like what you said. We joke around about things being factory installed. So (laughs) it's not factory (laughs) installed, but it is a little bit of our default. Mm -hmm. And rewiring it will take a lot of practice. But after a while, I'm sure it becomes like most things, like even Mm -hmm. measuring progress instead of perfection, it becomes an orientation. I love how Mm -hmm. we've been talking about it that way. I mean, of course, we'll fall off and we'll trip and we'll get back on. But it's a matter of catching yourself quickly, as you said, and am I making an empowered, and I might add conscious, (laughs) intentional choice? And that will get you back on that creator, challenger, coach pattern of the empowerment dynamic. So I love the coaching. And I think this is really, really key as an individual, but certainly as a leader, certainly as a manager, certainly as an owner, and as a team member. It counts for all of us. We all can react both ways or respond both ways. So I think it's very human and it's very, very applicable to our conversations every single day. All right. So just I want to remind everyone of the awesome resources. So it's The Power of TED with an asterisk. The asterisk is The Empowerment Dynamic by David Emerald, available on Amazon and wherever else you like to purchase your great reading material. I have a large Amazon account, just saying. <laughs> and then powerofted.com is the main website. And if you, again, if you want to go and check out a demo, go to learn.powerofted.com forward slash demo dash page dash one. And then you'll be able to get to go and play around. And if you want to do the online course like I do, <laughs> then that'll be something you can participate in as well. Mm. So David, just a huge, huge thank you for, I know this came out of personal insights for you, which people can read about in the book. 
I'm just so appreciative of you, A, having those incredible insights, but then also really sharing them in such an incredible, thoughtful, and articulate way with everyone else so it can just soak right in. So instantly, I appreciate that, and I appreciate being able to share this message with other people who are like-minded. So just a lot of, lot of gratitude for everything you've done so far and what you will continue to do. Thank you, Shannon. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. You're right. We could talk for the next three hours. <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you. And to all of our listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions or comments or want more information, please let us know at questions at strategiccoach.com. And as always, here's to your team success. Hi, Shannon here. And thank you very much for listening. If you like what you heard today, please take a moment to rate the Team Success Podcast on iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd share the podcast with anyone else who could benefit. If you're interested in learning more about the Strategic Coach Program for Entrepreneurs, visit us at strategiccoach.com or the Strategic Coach channel on YouTube. For free downloads and more team success strategies, visit teamsuccesshandbook.com. Mm-hmm.